we are just so pleased to have the support of our friends at the National Review Institute. It's very grateful for their support and, and fine to be here. This, this may be the, the beginning of uh, a closer connection that we're, we're working on, Matt and I, with, um, uh, with, the, with Hillsdale and the Kirby Center. And as Humphrey Bogart used to say, this may be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> I want to recall a telling moment in the life of the academy, a moment from about 17 years ago at Princeton, the year I was visiting there. A young student there in the summer of her junior year landed a job at the American Embassy at the Vatican. And from that point, she gained access to the diplomatic archives. When she returned to Princeton, she proceeded to work through the year on a senior thesis on the diplomacy of the Holy See. Her academic advisor and historian of the German background thought this was absolutely first rate. He gave it an A. The second reader observed that this thesis was evidently predicated on the notion that there were moral truths that held in all places. That was so palpably false, she said, that the thesis was flawed at the center, so she gave it a C plus. Under those conditions at Princeton, when there's such a discrepancy, uh, they bounced the thesis to a second to a third reader, who of course splits it down the middle, gives it a B plus, and so the woman with the third highest average in the Wilson Center in the Wilson School gets no honors at all. Now, that this, the Wilson enclave was a, kind of an enclave of evil at the time we were there. Um, but apart from that, this other part of the story is that uh, the, the woman who had offered that angle was taking up the mission at Princeton of teaching on international human rights. <laughs> rights. Human rights proclaimed in all places, but no objective moral truths to explain why those rights were indeed true and rightful. And so how did these rights come to hold their international standing? The answer that they were stipulated in conventions held to the end, the UN, containing credentialed people drawn from the best colleges and universities, rather like this, this woman herself. And they would set down for the world the understanding of the rights that should be respected in all places. Those rights would now include things like reproductive rights, abortion, same-sex marriage, transgenderism coming soon. But this is exactly what Dan Mahoney has taken up in his new book, The State of Mind, that proclaims rights without moral truths. It becomes an exercise in flexing the power of a new political class to give laws to the world, while at the same time extending the reach of liberation, mainly sexual liberation, by freeing us from those moral truths that gave people the grounds for casting moral judgments. So it frees us too then from what the Declaration of Independence called the, the author of the laws of nature, including the moral laws. The same creator who created the universal law of physics did not create a separate moral law for Lagos in Jersey City. And at the same time, the people who proclaim themselves to be citizens of the world, citizens of the cosmos polis, the cosmos polis, are not committed to any set of moral principles that can mark off the nature of the good regime or the best regime, or the most decent and practicable regime. Uh, they have an agenda formed of the fashions of the left, uh, but they're committed to utopias, Thomas More would have it, to, to nowhere in particular, a regime that doesn't exist because it has no defining principles to etch out its, its character. During our own constitutional convention, the engaging and formidable Gouverneur Morris with his usual bite, said, as to those philosophical gentlemen, those citizens of the world, as they call themselves, he owned that he did not wish to see any of them in public councils. He would not trust them. The men who can shake off their attachments to their own country can never love any other. These attachments, he said, are the wholesome prejudices which uphold all governments. And this from a worldly man who had become fluent in French as he became, came to represent his country in Paris during the revolution. This new political class cannot really be citizens of this American regime because his father Newhouse 
learned us long ago, they could not give a moral defense of this regime, an account of what makes this regime worthy of their respect and allegiance. Now, this is surely a problem that runs to the core of our current political situation and, the, uh, and fuels what we now call the culture wars. But it's been Dan Mahoney's disposition and character not to be deflected in his writing to softer or e easier questions. His writing and teaching have been directed to the central questions of political philosophy and statecraft. You know, he studies great books seriously, but he reminds us that this study of the great books has gone hand in hand with statecraft, with concerns about the forms of government and the practical measures that are rightful and wrongful, just and unjust, prudent and reckless. And so, in his study of political philosophy, he's been drawn also to a fine study of uh, Charles de Gaulle, but also to some of our most astute commentators, Raymond Aron, Bertrand de Juvenal, Alexander Sosnetsu. He's done seven books already, still going, and added to that remarkable number of edited volumes and, and on the writings of others. Now, you may detect here a certain accent on things French, and he has preserved a strong interest in French politics. He's done translations. He's been the main person bringing to, into our political discussions in this country the work of the French philosopher and political scientist, Pierre Manet. Dan did his undergraduate work at Holy Cross, his PhD at Catholic U. He found a home early on at Assumption College, but from that base, he's also reached out to teach as a visitor at, at Harvard, Boston College, and l'école des hautes études en sciences sociales, which we call in Chicago, tout à fait magnifique. <laughs> a fine achievement. He won the Raymond Aron Prize in France in 1991, but he was given a special recognition by his school by being named to the Augustan Chair in Distinguished Scholarship at Assumption College. He has adorned that college, let me tell you, and given that college even more luster over the years. He's been supernaturally productive, but as the line went in Charlotte's Web, he offers that enduring quality. He's the most reliable friend and a good writer. All of his gifts have come together, I think, in this new book, The Idol of Our Age. And so, would you join me in welcoming this friend to the lectern, Dan? Well, thank you for that wonderful and gracious introduction, Hadley. I've known Hadley for many years now. And I remember when Hadley was our commencement speaker some years ago. And he predicted, maybe 10 or 12 or 13 years before it happened, that we were on the way to having judicially imposed same-sex marriage. And the faculty had a conniption. Uh, either this was false, or it shouldn't be spoken about, or we shouldn't invite people who are in accord with the mission of our little Catholic college. So I think it was the first time poor Hadley had an had a bad reception from an audience. Do you remember that, Hadley? It was a, a trifecta. The audience was, the, 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 the students were hostile, the parents were with me, the faculty couldn't figure out what the hell I was doing. <laughs> that is a perfect description of that morning and afternoon in Worcester, Massachusetts. So. It's an ocean divided three ways. I never say Yes, that. yes. Assumption always had a little bit of the character of a Potemkin village, you know, with this faithful Catholic liberal arts college, but 75% of the faculty are nihilists. So, uh, you know, this is, this, and, and about 35% of their militantly anti-Catholic. So that was, that was the problem. So poor Hadley was coming. Poor Hadley was coming into a Potemkin village without uh, knowing it ahead of time. But you, you and Michael Patalik defended me. Yeah, well, we did. Well, in, in any case, uh, let me say a little bit of what my remarks are um, a kind of uh, summary or kind of distillation of some of the principal ideas 
in this book, The Idol of Our Age, How the Religion of Humanity Subverts Christianity that Hadley already referred to. And I wrote this book because for a long time I had the sense that something profound was happening in the Western world and within the Christian churches that simply didn't have an adequate name and didn't have an adequate <coughs> diagnosis. And, uh, and that is this double process of what I call depoliticization and dechristianization, or one could simply say the uh, assault on biblical religion and moral currents inspired by it. And um, I, I think, uh, as I say at one point in my book, and it's a remark inspired by the great French Catholic uh, poet and philosopher Charles Peguy, very famous in France, not well known in this country, heroes and saints stand and fall together. That classical and Christian wisdom always informed the regime of liberty. And, um, and in, in recent decades, we've seen a kind of moral denuding of modern liberty in a way where um, uh, many of the crucial prerequisites and supports of human liberty, uh, a self-governing nation state, authoritative institutions, the churches, real liberal universities dedicated to liberal inquiry, uh, even things like the army. Raymond Aron said in the 70s, we're in trouble when the Dutch allowed the unionization of the armed forces. You know, Holland didn't really have to worry about its defense. We would take care of them, but you really, this is what they did in uh, the provisional government in Russia in 1917. Order number one, the soldiers could disregard orders from their officers. So it seems to me that uh, free societies need authoritative institutions. They need authoritative truths. And liberty needs content that uh, uh, we need as a people, as a free people, as liberally educated men and women to think about in a serious way the ends and purposes of human freedom, and not just behind behind empty abstractions like autonomy, like this dreadful new state Supreme Court decision in Kansas, which just reduces the whole question of abortion to a right to do whatever you please, with no reflection on um, the meaning of human sexuality or natural complementarity of men and women or obligation to the young and the unborn, et cetera, et cetera. So when freedom becomes completely emptied of content, how does one choose? It's a great question Tocqueville raises in Democracy in America. He doesn't exactly use this word, but at the beginning of volume two of Democracy in America, he describes what I would call democratic vertigo. We're free, but what are we gonna do? Well, we have no grounds for choice. So Tocqueville famously argues, we look around and see what they're doing. And so the logical <laughs> consequence of this groundless affirmation of human choice is conformism, or kind of mass society where I take our bearings from what others are doing. And um, so in any case, um, I tried in this book to take aim at what I see as the fundamental ailment of Western societies today. And I call it the humanitarian subversion, both of traditional religion, biblical religion. I, I primarily have in mind the Christian churches, but I think it's a broader phenomenon affecting the whole of uh, Western monotheistic religion. And also free and decent politics. And obviously my critique of humanitarianism is not the critique of Pareto and the neo-Machiavellians of the early 20th century who blamed humanitarianism on Christianity. It just means softness, and a critique that goes back to Machiavelli. Uh, I think there's a meaningful distinction between authentic humanism and a kind of uh, soft religion of humanity that undercuts serious religiosity real philosophizing and free and decent politics.
So let me just start by saying um, a little bit more by what I use uh, two terms interchangeably in my book. One is humanitarianism and the other is the religion of humanity. And some of you may know the term religion of humanity was first used by Auguste Comte, the French sociologist, the founder of positivism, the man who told us we are only allowed to ask how questions but no why questions. So sociology was the new science of society that would leave religion, philosophy, and metaphysics behind. Uh, uh, and John Stuart Mill also, in some of his later uh, essays, was a somewhat less bizarre and more quiet, but still assertive advocate of the religion of humanity. Comte, you may know, crowned himself the high priest of humanity at Notre Dame in 1851. He invited the Pope, who didn't come, the head of the Jesuit order, who might have come today, and, uh, and um, the Russian Tsar, who had no interest in humanitarianism whatsoever. But um, he founded a religion. And you may also know that the only people who he wanted it to be a mass movement, as Eric Vogelin has argued. He wanted uh, the way Marxism became a mass movement with the, uh, the um, Third International. But only the Brazilians took, took them up. So the founders of the Brazilian Republic in the early 1890s were Comteans and uh, positivists. And uh, the secular religion of the initial Brazilian Republic was the religion of humanity. And a very anti-clerical, anti-Christian positivism but it never really became order and progress, which you see on the Brazilian flags when they win the World Cup. That's a Comtean phrase. <laughs> but in any case, um, uh, let me say a word about humanitarianism more broadly. My argument is that humanitarianism draws on Christianity, but radically distorts it in the process. It tends to see man, human beings, as the measure of everything, and to forget the transcendental dimensions of authentic religion. So in other words, this worldly amelioration, welfare measures, third worldism, you can think of all the equivalents. This is sort of the real heart and soul of religious commitment and religious engagement. Uh, it's the effectual truth of, the, of biblical religion. And I would say humanitarianism, as I've described it, has little sense of sin or limits. Humanitarians <laughs> tend to blame evil and criminality on unjust social structure. Some of us remember in the 60s, people would always talk about society or the system. The system made me do it. And um, progressive theologians today speak about social sin rather than personal sin. And by the way, most humanitarians believe, I think, in a soft version of the old principle of the perfectibility of human beings in society. Now, in its sort of university forms, academic forms, and among progressive intellectuals more broadly, I think most contemporary humanitarians believe, and I think this is really literally absurd, but they believe that the West and the West alone is an essentially culpable civilization. It's racist, it's exploitative, it's unjust, and almost all of them are blind towards the totalitarian enemies of civilized order. I just wrote a tribute for my uh, late lamented friend, Paul Hollander, that will appear in the June issue of the New Criterion. And Paul had a mission since he left Hungary in 1956 to chronicle the stupidity of modern intellectuals. Uh, and uh, he did it many books, but most famously in Political Pilgrims. The Red Dean of Canterbury, Hewlett Johnson, who personally met Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and many others, and as I say in my tribute to Paul, confuse Stalin with an exemplar of the Beatitudes. Um, so here's a humanitarian, the Red Dean of Canterbury, who actually saw in the hard humanitarianism of totalitarianism, 
the sort of existential embodiment of biblical religion. Um, I, I also think that um, at its heart, humanitarianism is pacifistic, uh, believing in peace at any price. And this is something I think that's particularly ascendant today in progressive Catholic circles, including this rather progressive papacy. Um, let me give you some examples. Uh, and by the way, if the, the present pontiff can change Catholic teaching on the death penalty, there's no reason why he can't declare just war to be obsolete as a result of our discovery of a higher human consciousness. But uh, for example, uh, the Pope, my, in my, uh, my book I call a half humanitarian, I, as being modest, um, he has openly flirted with pacifism. Um, now, of course, Christianity is a morally demanding religion that requires imperfect human beings to forgive their enemies. But as Remy Brog very nicely says in a blurb on my books, we're supposed to do the impossible, love our enemies, but we're not supposed to delude ourselves that we don't have enemies. You know, and I think humanitarianism and the humanitarianism that has infected the churches really believes we live in a world without sin, without evil, without tyranny, without struggle, without politics. And, um, and uh, um, loving our enemies is also compatible from time to time with fighting them. Uh, it is, of course, the Christian religion properly understood, I think, is incompatible with terrorism, wars of aggression, <laughs> cruelty, but the order of charity demands that legitimately constituted authorities protect those under their care from violence, tyranny, and aggression. As Roger Scruton has put it, the right of self-defense stems from our obligations to others. The Sermon on the Mount is not a call for societal suicide or even a guide to public policy. As scholars have noted, Christ's rather effusive praise for the Roman centurion on the road to Capernaum, Matthew 8, 5, 13, is hardly compatible with pacifism. Yet in a recent book with a French social scientist, Dominique Fulton, Pope Francis declares, no war is ever just, and one always wins with peace. Now, he has obviously not considered the peace of the grave, and the soulless despotism that so preoccupied Immanuel Kant. I'm referring to perpetual peace. Um, Kant was against a world state because he feared it would be a soulless despotism. By seemingly siding with peace at any price, this mode of thinking prevents statesmen, including statesmen guided by biblical wisdom, from carrying out their responsibilities to justice and the common good. In the same book of interviews, please don't read it, it's too depressing, Francis forthrightly blames modern war on money. Now, I'm going to be bold enough to say this is an exceedingly crude and reductionist account of the, uh, that ignores the manifestly political and even spiritual reasons for human confl conflict. And the pontiff seems to think terrorists are motivated by economic deprivation rather than blind hatred or fanatical religious passion. Um, you may remember the line in um, The Joy of the Gospel where the Pope says, an authentic reading of the Koran is incompatible with every form of violence. The Pope's thinking on these matters is strangely economistic, even paramarxist, and shows no engagement with what I would call the heterogeneity of human motives. Um, and that means pleasure, virtue, the noble, the just, anger at injustice, the ambition to rule or even change the world or to save souls that animate the souls of men. And to put it bluntly, one expects more expertise in the soul from the Holy Roman Pontiff and not the crude and reductive economism that he displays in these interviews. 
Um, so, now, humanitarians also have a, hot, a soft spot for doctrinaire or fanatical egalitarianism and typically confuse love of the poor with collectivist or socialist politics, although one must add humanitarians are not necessarily Marxists. Most humanitarians are blind to or downplay the grave evils of abortion and euthanasia and tend toward full-scale relativism in the realm of personal morality. But they are exceedingly moralistic and dismiss those who oppose their agenda as phobes, racists, homophobes, Islamophobes, etc. So name calling replaces the exchange of arguments. And I think this type they usually dispense, or they dispense with a rigorous or demanding natural moral law that appeals to something beyond human needs or human desires. Um, let, me, let me develop that thought about um, relativism and moralism. I really think this is the dominant feature, if you do a kind of phenomenology of the moral life of the academy today or Western intellectuals, what strikes me is the combination of, in a toxic form, of limitless relativism with limitless moralism. I think it's the most striking feature of the modern moral order. Uh, Left-wing humanitarians and progressive churchmen spout on about social justice as if opponents of doctrinary egalitarianism hate the poor or support social justice. The history of the term social justice is quite interesting. It was first used by an Italian Jesuit in 1841, Taparelli de Zeglio. But he was an old-fashioned Thomist who uh, meant by it nothing like socialist or socialism or doctrinary egalitarianism. And it was used by Pius XI and Quadrigestino Anno 40 years after, which was the uh, sequel to Rerum Novorum. And that's the encyclical that says, no man can be a Catholic and a socialist at the same time. And it's also the encyclical that first articulated the famed principle of subsidiarity. So whatever Pius XI meant, he did not mean socialism or collectivism. But what does social add to justice? I'm waiting for somebody to explain it to me. What does the adjective add to the noun? Now, in this, this new moral universe of toxic moralism and toxic relativism, the taking of an unborn life is merely a choice, which is, one assumes, completely beyond good and evil. That's why one never hears what one is choosing. And who can be against free choice? To argue that marriage, and notice my language, has some, some link to the complementarity of men and women and to natural procreation and to the education of citizens, because why else would the political community be interested in marriage if it's just a mutual a contract for the manipulation of genitalia? I hate to tell you, that's Immanuel Kant. Uh, did you know that was Immanuel Kant? No, I don't that. He called, in one of his writings, he calls marriage a contract for the mutual manipulation of genitalia. This is not the highest and most dignified notion of marriage, I assure you. Um, it wasn't in the critique of pure reason. <laughs> the, um, um, so anyway, um, and who could be against love? Free choice, autonomous choice, trumps, and this is the key point, any respect for the directedness of human freedom toward natural ends or purposes. A kind of juvenile existentialism marked more by farce than angst has become the default position of our age. Many people have noted Justice Kennedy's remarks in the Casey case, which is kind of an endorsement of teenage existentialism, you know creating meaning in the universe and all of that. and Again, this idea of an autonomy where a human being is completely
completely bereft of any grounds for any choice whatsoever. And again, our political order is a political order founded on natural rights, but obviously, notice natural, and it presupposed something like natural law, that um, the rights uh, were not just idiosyncratic decisions to pursue happiness any way you want, but there are civilized ways of pursuing happiness and decent ways, and there are uncivilized and indecent ways. And not, uh, some, some of our founders articulated that much more self-consciously. Um, Hamilton, I think this is a passage that Hadley and I both like from the letter to Seabury in 1775. He's a very young man, and he um, denounces Hobbes for not believing in any superintending principle of the human good above the human will that informs our exercise of liberty. That's the very young. Can you imagine one of our students at 18 explaining perfectly what's wrong with Hobbes, you know? But um, that was the young. I don't think that made it into the musical. Yeah. I haven't seen the musical. I. Uh, I was turned off when they booed the vice president, and plus the tickets are too expensive. Um, so in, in any case, um, um, I, these are sort of harsh words, and they're said very directly, but I, I, I really want to make sense of this movement from ordered liberty or from what Tocqueville in the Overgeme and the Revolution calls liberty under God and the law, to this groundless affirmation of liberty that is perfectly compatible with any choice, no matter how thoughtless, no matter how irresponsible, no matter how extreme. Harvey Mansfield once said, some of our contemporary social theorists, legal scholars, seem to think that a right is not real unless it's exercised irresponsibly. And uh, so, so uh, let me say a few more words about our friend August Comte. Uh, Comte, who theorized the religion of humanity in a rather bizarre way, but Comte said, and, and I'm really perplexed by how much this bold and empty atheism has informed even the self-understanding of believers. He said that love of humanity must replace love of God. And if you know a little French, he called man le grand être, the great being. So that's the language of traditional theology. Who should we worship? ourselves. The problem is that self-deification is not a very helpful ground for human freedom or human excellence or for cultivating and elevating and developing the capacities of the human soul. And I think it's because authentic nobility always depends, and I don't think one has to be a theist or a religious believer to affirm this, but it ultimately depends on the subordination of what is human to what is above man. Um, and uh, when man becomes, or humanity becomes the object of its own deification or self-worship, that becomes, I think, deeply destructive of uh, the prospects for both a humble gratitude for the order of being, but also for a kind of human greatness that strives to rise above the ordinary. So paradoxically, uh, Comtean humanitarianism destroys both magnanimity, greatness, heroism. It also destroy, destroys humility, sanctity. Comte also predicted in 1841 that nations and wars would disappear among the avant-garde of humanity. And the avant-garde of humanity was Europe. In a way, contemporary West Europe is rather Comtean. I think um, Pierre Menon talks about the European vacation. You can assume 
the truth of depoliticization or the obsolescence of politics and wars and nations when the United States has effectively been responsible for your national defense uh, since 1945. The Germans, Merkel's government is now claiming they're gonna up the spending on military spending of GDP from 1.35% of GDP to 1.6. And of course, Germany is the, Germ Germany has a problem, of course, which is how does one affirm a meaningful and humane and decent sense of patriotism and nationhood that doesn't reduce what it means to be German to the terrible years of 1933 to 1945. So who would have predicted in uh, the 1942 that the problem that we would have with the Germans was a uh, inability to uh, 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 recognize the legitimate role of martial virtue in human life, you know? Um, and maybe the Japanese needed an army after all after we imposed uh, pacifistic self-defense forces on them in MacArthur's constitution. So in any case, um, there's two sides of uh, Comte. There's the side that wanted to replace philosophy and theology with positivism and the religion of humanity. And then there's the side of Comte that wanted to jettison uh, nations and churches and all forms of human particularity in the name of what Comte called a unified humanity. Um, but I think all this thinking forgets the old insight. I think many moderate enlightenment thinkers understood this, certainly the classics and Christians understood it. We really only have access to the universal on a, in a political and social way through the mediation of particular communities that promote the common good. So the idea that we have direct access to le grand être, humanity, or that we need a world governing authority. You know, all these uh, progressive Catholics who think, oh, you know, we need a bigger UN and we need world governing authority. Have they noticed that the real UN is bitterly and deeply anti-Catholic and, uh, and would impose policies on population, on abortion, on, on many other matters that would uh, be, I think, quite um, destructive of uh, what the church stands for. But uh, there's somehow this confidence that a world state or world government would serve uh, traditional ends. It, it won't. Um, all right. Um, I want to say, um, say another, uh, a bit of, a bit, I don't have much time left, but um, I have a large part of, at least two chapters of my book are dedicated to a reflection by Christian thinkers on the reality of evil. And I look at uh, Vladimir Soloviev, the great Russian philosopher. Uh, by the way, a very devout Orthodox theologian and philosopher who was proto-Catholic and who also translated Plato and Nietzsche into Russian. So that's an interesting combination. Um, Soloviev wrote a famous um, final work. He died at 47 in 1900. It was published. It's called War, Progress, and the End of History. And it has an appendix called A Short Tale of the Antichrist. Make a long story short, there are two main figures, two main interlocutors in War, Progress, and the End of History. Z who stands for Soloviev, and the prince, who is a Tolstoyan. Uh, Tolstoy was a disciple of Rousseau, who did not believe in original sin, who believed that the heart and soul of Christianity was pacifism. He wanted the Beatitudes to be the basis of political law and civil society. And he also... Um, uh, he was also a Marcionite, which is that old Christian heresy that says, get rid of all the Jewish elements, the dirty Jewish elements in Christianity. Because the Old Testament you know, has wars, and Jehovah is sometimes demanding in this, and uh, this doesn't seem to be ca compatible with the new law of love. So uh, Tolstoy, we think of Tolstoy the great novelist, maybe War and Peace is the greatest novel of all time, but this 
cranky old Tolstoy, the kingdom of God is within you, the, the man who deeply influenced Gandhi and was deeply influenced by Rousseau, is a bit of a crank. And, um, but um, Soleviev thought that he had no appreciation of the reality of evil, the drama of good and evil in the human soul. So uh, Tolstoy said, we will convert everyone through our benignity. You know, we're going to be good people, and our goodness will shine, and evil will be abolished, and politics will disappear, and there'll be no more wars. So Leviev says, Christ was on the cross with two criminals, and one of them repents, and Christ says, this day you shall be with me in paradise. The other one doesn't repent, and uh, in other words, Jesus' benignity was not able to change the disposition or the capacity for evil for the other criminal. So Soleviev thought, Soleviev, uh, there's a big debate in the uh, War Progress in the End of History. Um, the prince, the Tolstoyan character, says um, wars are always bad and, and, uh, and peace is always good, like Pope Francis. And uh, Soleviev and Mr. Z insist there can be, of course there can be evil wars, but there can be evil pieces too. And that's the nub of the matter, whether or not evil is substantial enough that it sometimes needs to be resisted. And I should say, I also deal with Solzhenitsyn's Red Wheel, where there's a debate between a young soldier and an army chapter ch uh, chaplain, really about Tolstoy, and about whether or not um, war is the absolute and uh, the absolute evil. And Father Severian argues there are many things that are spiritually dirtier and more terrible than war. And he too argues that loving our enemies does not mean a kind of naivete about the foothold uh, that evil can have in the human world. So Solzhenitsyn argues that one needs an active struggle against evil in one's soul, but also that has a accompaniment in political and social life. Obviously not support for endless war, not a support for cruelty or wars of aggression, but a willingness that, what I call stoic apathy, that you just sort of withdraw from society and disregard the common good and find some inner spiritual peace. This is not either a sufficiently human or biblical response to the problem of evil, certainly at the level of politics and the common good. And a final remark or two. Um, I end my book with a discussion of, inspired by Pope Benedict, who is one of the heroes of the book. Uh, the Pope Emeritus is one of the heroes of the book. Um, a discussion of conscience. Because I think one of the presuppositions of this relativistic moralism, the religion of humanity that is informed by it and gives rise to it, is that moral choice is groundless. In the social sciences, we have the famous distinction between facts and values. Leo Strauss had very good things to say about that in Natural Right History, where he said, if you actually wrote a value-free description of the concentration camps, it would be a bitter and dark satire. You, you can't talk about murderous ideological tyranny without making value judgments that are not arbitrary. Tyranny has a certain nature that uh, is, uh, can only be described through quali qualitative judgments. So in any case, um, my argument is we do have access to um, moral and political judgment. And of course, there are many paths here. One path would be to look at some of our forebears, like Lincoln. You know, you look at his Peoria speech, he makes an, a wonderful argument based on the natural moral sense against slavery. And that's an argument that doesn't necessarily depend upon revelation, but it's a very compelling and convincing argument. But I argue that what the Christian tradition calls conscience, and again, one doesn't have to be a Christian or a religious believer, but um, I argue that there is what the Book of Kings calls a listening heart. 
There really is a law written on the hearts of man, as St. Paul says, that gives us our initial access to an order of truth and moral judgment. And uh, as Pierre Menant, the French Catholic political philosopher, has put it, it is that moral and cognitive faculty internal to human beings, kind of a pre-theoretical understanding of good and evil that needs to be tutored, that needs to be educated, that has to be informed by learning. The Christian church has always taught that there can be erring conscience. You know, you, you, you. But in any case, um, this provides precious help for political prudence and political reason. Um, and uh, you may know there's a famous letter by Cardinal Newman called the Letter to the Duke of Norfolk. Lots of people quoted this in the 60s. Newman says conscience is everything. Newman could not be more clear that true conscience has nothing to do with subjective arbitrariness. It has to do with... Uh, uh, Newman was the scourge of what C.S. Lewis later called the poison of subjectivism. Conscience allows free men and women to live in truth, or to aspire to live in truth, and to reject those lies that deny human beings have a nature that sets boundaries to our misnamed autonomy. Pope Benedict, in a great speech to the uh, German Bundestag in 2011, said there were probably many more ecologists than Christians and Jews in the Bundestag. So he said, you know, you're right. We, we have, ecology is important, but there's also a moral ecology. And we have a nature. And let's pay some attention to it because it can give us some signs, not only about limits, but also about what it means to be a decent and responsible and virtuous human being. And if I had more time, I would argue that something like conscience inspired by biblical reflection needs to be coupled with uh, what the ancients, what Aristotle calls, and Cicero, the cardinal virtues prudence, justice, temperance, moderation of fortitude. And, um, uh, but um, the starting point is all of us as self-conscious human beings in community with others um, participate in this drama of good and evil in the human soul. And that uh, relativism is not the truth of human choice or the human soul. And I think conscience is this precious gift that first allows us to navigate liberty, truth, and virtue in a way that's fitting for the moral and political animals that we are. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you.